Welcome to the American Institute for Stuttering's 14th Annual Freeing Voices Changing Lives Gala. We are so happy you are all able to join us in our new virtual format. My name is Siri and I have been working with my speech therapist Haya since March 2019. It has really changed my life. Thank you to all of tonight's donors for your support of the American Institute for Stuttering so that kids and adults who stutter, just like me, are able to benefit from this amazing organization. We hope you enjoy the night. And now here's our good friend and my personal hero, Emily Blunt. Siri, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. I appreciate it so much. Welcome everybody to the American Institute of Stuttering's annual gala. I hope you're all keeping well. I hope you're safe. I am so sorry we can't be together live this year, but that does not stop the fun from entering into people's homes. I've even put on a dress for the first time in about four months and it feels a bit alien, but kind of amazing. So I'm a stutterer and I know I don't sound like one now, um, but I suffered a severe one for most of my childhood and well into my teens. So stutterers are my heroes. I love a stutterer. And I remember when I first met the extraordinary people at the American Institute of Stuttering, just thinking, oh my gosh, I wish, I wish I'd met them sooner. Because any kind of speech therapy that I had done or that I had experienced or come across had always been about masking your stutter. And this was about embracing it. The idea that if you can wrap your arms around that part of yourself, then you're released from the grip of seeing it as anything negative. And it's extraordinary, the work that they do. I think they are incredible. They have just freed voices all over the world. Um, I love being an advocate for them. I love nights like tonight where we can free up people's voices because we need to, because we all have a story to tell and we all deserve to be heard. And that is what tonight is about. So I want to free up some voices. I want to raise awareness and we want to help some people out. So I'm going to introduce actually my incredible friend, Eric Danalo. He is the chairman of the board here at the American Institute of Stuttering. And he is the one who is going to guide us through tonight's events. Eric. Thank you, Emily, for getting us started with our first ever virtual gala and for being such a great friend and supporter of the American Institute for Stuttering. I want to personally acknowledge and thank you for all you've done over the years. You're such a fantastic friend. And we're so grateful that you could all join us this evening. And despite these unusual and difficult times, we are still able to gather and further the mission of an organization that is so important to all of us. Stuttering is the most difficult thing I've ever had to deal with. And if I can do anything to help anyone out there who also has to deal with stuttering, and especially the children whose lives can be transformed, I wanna dedicate as much as possible to the organization and the stuttering community. So sit back, relax, and enjoy what is sure to be an engaging and an uplifting event. And now the American Institute for Stuttering is proud to announce the Freeing Voices Changing Lives 2020 Award recipient, John Hendrickson. Since graduating from Penn State University, John has been a featured writer for Rolling Stone, Esquire, and the Denver Post, just to name a few. Currently, John works as a senior editor for The Atlantic, writing articles across the political spectrum, including a feature on Vice President Biden and his journey with stuttering. Thank you for all that you do for the stuttering community. Congratulations, John Hendrickson. Thank you, AIS, for this honor. Thank you, Vice President Biden, for allowing me to interview you about stuttering and therefore allowing me to reflect on my own life as a person who stutters. Thank you to The Atlantic for giving me the time and space and resources to write this piece. Thank you to the readers and people who stutter all over the world for sharing their own personal stories with me. Thank you to my friends and family 
for your undying support and encouragement. I'd like to dedicate this to my girlfriend, Liz. More than anything, more than even love, Liz has given me the gift of acceptance. And without that, none of this would be possible. Thanks again, and I'm truly honored to be a member of this community. I'm so thrilled you're here with us, Mr. Vice President. We're so lucky to have you. And John, congrats again on your award. It's fabulous. And thank you for your beautiful speech. Um, we're very honored to have you both here. Um, so the three of us, you know, we all share something. And um, we all grew up with really severe stutters. Um, so we are Team Stutter, you know, and I just think it could be a great band name. We could be pretty huge. I think so. We could, we could take this on the road, I'm just saying. Um, but we are all here to discuss um, growing up with stutters and how that impacted our lives. Um, so I'm gonna kick us off here. And um, I'll start with you, Mr. Vice President. Um, I just wanted to know about your stutter and its embryonic stages. What did that feel like for you um, when it first emerged for you as a child? How did that feel when you were young? I, uh, I just remember going off to grade school, a place called St. Paul's in Greenridge Corners in, in Scranton. And uh, I remember being made aware, first conscious memory I have is I got a nickname and the nickname was given to me by a nun, they called me Bye Bye Biden. There used to be a song that was very popular in my dad's generation called Bye Bye Blackbird. It was a popular song. And so, she, when I guess, uh, I, don't even, I don't consciously remember the actual stuttering, but I remember the nickname hung on to me. Mm. And it was Bye Bye Blackbird, because I had trouble saying B -B Biden. Mm. And uh, that's the first conscious uh, thing I remember about uh, stuttering. And, uh, and quite frankly, uh, uh, I didn't stutter that much with my friends, my close buddies. But when I'd be in school and have to read or have to stand up and say something or I guess as early as having to say my name, that's yeah. when I first became aware of it. I think that's when I became aware of mine. I remember um, really being desperate to read my poem in class and I really wanted to share it. And yet I would stand up and just freeze and not be able to speak properly. And it's hard for kids to understand why you can't speak fluently. Yeah. And I remember kids being like, just say it, what's wrong with you? Just say it, you know, yeah. it was just really hot. And I, and I empathize with them too, because they didn't understand it and I didn't understand it. Um, what about you, John? When did you first notice it emerging for you? I remember in kindergarten being pulled out of class by a woman who wasn't a teacher and I didn't know why there was only me being pulled out of class. And we walked down to this little windowless room in the basement of our school. And it was always, we're going to work on your problem. We're going to teach you how to talk normally and it was always this beating around the bush and just never calling it what it is mm -hmm. i think it i think at that early age it doesn't it doesn't subdue on us this kind of avoidance and a, a desire to look away because all we want to do is feel normal to read out loud like every other kid in class to order a piece of pizza in the cafeteria like every other kid but it's hard yeah it's this invisible it's, 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 
dis disruption and, until the moment it manifests. And then it's all you see. And then you can feel like it's all you are. Yeah. That yeah. obviously isn't the case. Yeah, and I, and I felt like there was an imposter living in me or something that was such a misrepresentation of who I really was. Um, and I think, you know, often what I found is that it's such a anguished experience, particularly for parents of a child who stutters. And Mr. Vice President, you've spoken so movingly about your mother in the past. I've loved um, a story that I heard about her because she sounded like a woman not to be messed with um, in protecting you and giving you the confidence that you needed. So I would love you to share with us that sort of support she provided you with at the time. Well, I think my mother maybe understood it more because she grew up with an older brother his whole life who stuttered very badly. Right. But my mother would always, the good thing about, I thought, the good thing about my mother my mother would never finish a sentence for me. My mother would not rush it. My mother would say, Time? and wait till the, you finish the sentence. Um, my mother would always say to me as I was going out, even my, my uh, grandkids say it now in a different way for different things, she said, Joey, look at me. She'd go like this, look at me, Joey, look at me. You are so smart, Joey. You're brighter than anybody. She once dragged me in and made the nun show me my IQ test. You are so smart, Joey. You are so smart. Joey, it's just you can't get the words out quick as you think them. So just take your time, honey. And you are this. And she just built me up all the time. Everything was about you can do this. And my dad was a really gentle and really determined man. And my dad used to say, Joey, never explain, never complain. Just get up. Just mm -hmm. get up. Everything's about getting up. It doesn't define you, Joey. Yeah. This is not who you are. It has nothing to do how bright you are. Nothing to do with these other things. And the thing I admire so much about John, John, I can't get over how much courage I think you have as a man as brilliant as you are, still struggling with some difficult moments, going on television, going out interviewing people. I mean, it takes, I, I, I wouldn't be able to do it. You have enormous, enormous, enormous courage. And everything with my mother was, she said, you know, Joey, courage is the greatest virtue of all because without it, you could not love with abandon. That's, that's such a wonderful point and a true point to make because so often it feels so all consuming that it really feels like it's defining you for these kids. And I, I say to kids all the time who come and speak to me, you know, this is, this is a part of you. This is not the whole you. And by the way, everyone's got something. And this is just your thing. And Bingo. Got something. Bingo. And the other thing is, if you think about it, uh, I think for all of us, I, John and I had a brief conversation about it. I think it's, uh, I think people look at us like if we stutter, we must be stupid. There must be yeah. something must be something wrong with us in terms of our mental capacity. And it has zero to do with intelligence quotient. Zero, zero. to do. And uh, it turns out, John, you were right. A lot of this is hereditary, uh, uh, according to the news data. And so I, I just think that uh, it's, um, it really is uh, too many kids uh, are get defined by it. Yeah. Lose their confidence. I agree. And I think that there, the problem is that there's so much misinformation out there about it and it's misinterpreted in so many ways, you know, because I think, I think you're right, Mr. Vice President, they, they often think of it as psychological or that you have a nervous disposition or something, but it is hereditary, it is neurological, and it is not your fault. And yeah. there's nothing you can do about it. And I just want kids to really remember that, you know, and I want the awareness to be raised about that so that we can really support these kids and make it known that it's very common. It happens all the time and it really isn't your fault. And so I think I wanted to ask you um, on that same track, why do you think people are so intolerant and so unempathetic towards stuttering? I think bullies are essentially insecure people who in fact lack confidence in themselves and try to take it out 
they are people who project whatever their insecurity is on other people. And, uh, but it's nonetheless hurtful. People who lack overwhelming confidence in themselves are the first ones to go after somebody else. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and it's, uh, but the other side of it is when I stand up and I'm trying to make a point to an audience that I understand what bullies are like. And I'll say, you know, it's kind of hard when you're in seventh grade to say to the girl in your class, will you g g g go, go to the dance with me? Um, the little, you know, school dance. Um, and uh, people will laugh when I tell that. And I look at them and I say, now, what makes you think you can laugh at that? If I told you when I was in seventh grade, I asked a young girl, I used to have a cleft palate, and I was afraid to ask her to go to the dance with me, or had a club foot, or I had a withered arm. None of you would have laughed. That's and it's right. interesting to watch them. They become introspective, like, you know, why did I? Why did I laugh at that? You can almost see them apologizing for having done it. And that's when I referenced the King's speech. Um, and by the way, the fellow who wrote the King's speech, and he had a copy of it for the, for, for the movie, sent me an actual copy of the speech because he does, the King did his speeches just like I do. I put hash marks, as John knows, on, so to remind me not to just try to run through too quickly, I just so I get a rhythm to what I'm doing still. I mean, for me, you know, I, I had this extraordinary teacher when I was about 11 or 12. It was when my stutter was at its, you know, height. And me too. Yeah. And, and he said to me, you know, do you want to be in the class play? And I went. And he said, well, I think you should. I think I think you I've seen you. I've seen you out there with your friends and doing impersonations and silly voices. And I think you I think you should try. And I was like. And he said, but why don't you do it in a silly voice? Why don't you do an accent? And it was sort of remarkable from somebody who wasn't a stutterer, had no experience with anyone who stuttered other than one of his students, to sort of say, remove yourself from yourself, see what happens. And for the first time I spoke completely fluently, I was doing a terrible Northern English accent, but I did speak <laughs> fluently. And I remember my mother in the audience just like, <sighs> You know, it was so intense for her but, and so incredible for her to see that because it was the first time that I had been able to stop the record from skipping. And it is extraordinary to me that you have so many actors that are heavily involved with American Inst Institute of Stuttering, like Bruce Willis, Samuel L. Jackson. Um, and we all still struggle with it now and then. I certainly, in, in scenes where it's like a high octane situation, where it's something like, get in the car or something like that, that's when I really struggle with it still. And, and I sometimes rephrase the line or I'll substitute a word that might be easier for me. And so you still end up doing that juggle still. And I think once you are a stutterer, it'll always be with you in some way, you know. Um, I think it's I, a great gift we got, though. I think it is. It no, I really do. Yeah. And John, um, you know on that same track of how I'm sort of very grateful for having a stutter, how vice president's very grateful for having one. Um, this is a question for you. You know, how do you feel stuttering has made you a better interviewer? Um, you know, is, is, is you described the action sequence in a movie. If you had to yell like that, it's hard. If I was sitting in that, briefing room and I had to yell out a question over 50 of my journalism colleagues. I don't think I could uh, get it out. But one on one, I think I disarm my interview subjects because they look at me and they listen to me and they see a person who a, a person who has stutters and they see a human they see a real person they don't just see a journalist they don't just 
see a, you know, a person trying to get some sort of gotcha quote, if they see a real person who's really listening. And I think more than anything, having a, a satutter gives you an enormous amount of empathy. Yeah. I think yes. it, it makes you a better listener. It makes you uh, more observant. But more than anything, it just it makes you empathetic to people from all walks of life. And therefore, it's easy to uh, talk to people. Yeah, I think, I think that's very true. I think that kids who stutter, they are the most observant kids. They pick up on everything. They don't miss anything. They're very, they're very good readers of people mm -hmm. and a situation. They have great taste in people and in the friends that they make. So it's actually a real gift. I mean, empathy is in some ways, um, I think acting is sort of the ultimate form of empathy. So I feel very grateful that I experienced struggle because I think if I hadn't, I don't know if I'd be able to fully understand some of the people that I played who were not always the most straight and narrow, you know. Yeah. Well, and don't you think that it also uh, makes you realize everybody has something beyond their control? That's it. Everybody has something that they're being judged on that has nothing to do with the conscious choice they made. I think it's the greatest gift I was given. Yeah. I, I, I genuinely mean that. My word. I've been, I've been saying this for over 50 years. It's the greatest gift I was given, knowing how it feels to be humiliated. Yeah. Knowing how it feels to be judged for something that is nothing you consciously went ahead and did and you're trying to deal with. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, but it there's is a, a gift. Really, there's a really beautiful phrase that I love, which is um, the cracked parts of us is where the light shines through. And I've always loved it because um, it's emblematic of what we're all talking about here today. Um, but I think it's a very positive message for these kids to hold on to. And so in speaking to our younger self, what, what do you wish your younger self had known about having a stutter that you know now? I would tell my younger self that all those days when reading in class was impossible or when ordering off the menu was impossible and all of those daily situations that beat you down that make you want to give up that make you want to just retreat into your bedroom into yourself all of those moments are giving you Ripped. All of those moments are motivating you to eventually work harder than all of your competitors. You can buy a lot of things in life and you can take a lot of things in life, but you can't fake Great and the determination. I you love have, it. You have them both. In the end, that it would be a gift. It would have a lot to do with who I become. It would have a lot to do with what I uh, set out to try to do. I always was the guy who uh, thought I could fix everything. And I think it's given me an insight that I wouldn't have otherwise had. The thing that I find that is, I got to remind myself all the time. Remember, you can make a gigantic difference in a kid's life. And there's yeah. so many talented kids out there now that are part of this organization. So many. And we're hearing some of them tonight. And they're incredibly inspiring and moving. And that's why I love what they do at American Institute of Stuttering. Because it's about embracing that part of yourself, not masking it. 
and it's terribly emboldening and it's terribly important. Um, so thank you both so much for all the support that you've given the organization. I'm a massive advocate for it. I love them there. And um, I wish I'd known them when I was growing up. I'm sure you guys do as well. Um, Congratulations, John. Congratulations, John. Back to you, Eric. Congratulations, John. Your writing has been so inspirational to me and the entire stuttering community. I want to thank you for all your work. And thank you, Emily and Vice President Biden, for being a part of the American Institute for Stuttering. We deeply appreciate all that you've done. Up next, longtime friends and advisors, Arthur Blank and Clarence Page, join us for a conversation about finding success in stuttering. Thanks, Eric, and thank you for hosting this incredible event, AIS, your first socially distant gala. I'm ha very happy to have this opportunity to talk with my good friend and fellow stutterer, Arthur Blank. Many of you know Arthur from his past contributions to this gala. In addition to owning the Atlanta Falcons and co-founding Home Depot, Arthur is a trusted pioneer in the business and sports world alike. Arthur, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Clarence. It's nice, uh, nice seeing you. I'm glad to know that you're healthy and well, and you look great. So it's, you too, uh, it's fantastic. Great to thank you. Well, I'd like to get right into it. Uh, did your speech, your uh, uh, what uh, uh, impediment, as they call it, uh, have any impact on the direction of your career? I've been curious about this. When I was younger, uh, it did create some some barriers for me that I had to kind of work my way through. Um, to be comfortable in uh, speaking in all kinds of forms, and um, and that didn't happen it happened by itself. Um, my uh, my mother was a strong influence. I know um, that uh, Vice President Biden. That was the case with him, and one of my good friends who passed away this last year, Jack Welch. That was the case with him as well. And um, I think one of the things that made a difference for me, a major difference for me was that my mother kept reminding me that what I had to say was important, um, had value, and, um, and however long it took to say it, you say it. And uh, the other thing which I think um, I've learned over the years that has been, um, there's a lot of work on the fluency side when people stutter and uh, can they be successful in working through their blockage issues and stuttering issues and whatever else it may be. and. Um, there's been some success with that, um, and there's been a fair amount of success with it, but there's also been a fair amount of people that have tried one course and another course and another course, et cetera. And I think that, you know, at the end of the day, the most successful um, approach that I have seen and heard and have been exposed to is one where I think we instill uh, in children and teens and adults uh, the notion that their voice matters that what they have to say matters. It represents their heart and their spirit and their energy and their brains and every, every part of them. So, you know, whether they stutter or not and whether they get over the fluency issue uh, or not should not determine the value of what they have to say, which it doesn't obviously determine the value of what they're thinking. And that, that sense, I own this space, uh, I'm responsible for what I'm saying, I wanna make sure that it's heard, however long it may take to get it out, and it does, whatever it may be. Um, but I would encourage everybody as they work on their fluency to understand the end game is not necessarily being fluent. That's nice to have and important to have. But it's most important that you feel strong personally and that you feel that what you have to say and offer to the world has great value. Um, and, uh, so I would encourage everybody work on your fluency, but understand your empowerment, your voice needs to be heard. However, however, however it comes across. Well, if I can pursue that just a little bit, uh, uh what advice would you give to someone who feels like they, they, there's a certain profession, a certain field they want to go into, but feel, well, maybe I better not try that, uh, uh, not with, with my impediment. What would you advise them? Well, I, you know, I think, you know, one of our guests tonight is, uh, is Vice President Biden, is Emily Blunt, uh, yourself, Clarence, you know, me. Uh, I think there are really no limits. Uh, that stuttering should not define who we are and what we are. And while it's great to work through it, I mean, I've spoken to the Vice President about this myself. I mean, he still makes adjustments in the way 
he writes his speeches, the way he delivers his speeches. Uh, he understands sometimes he was very public when he did the Anderson Cooper interview uh, about, you know, how it affected his life, but, you know, how he made sure that he always spoke up. So I think that, um, you know, you make adjustments, uh, you, you deal with what you have to deal with, but you never back down from who you are and what you are and what you have to contribute uh, to uh, to any conversation under any set of circumstances. And I think that uh, you can find people in every industry that are incredibly successful that have gotten over stuttering or haven't gotten over stuttering. Whether you have or have not should not define your success and your ability to succeed. I've run across so many people who say that uh, uh, they're – uh, parents, the early, the early reaction when they realized their child had a stutter was to say, now just slow down, take your time. Did that happen to you? Yeah, I'm sure. Yes, it did. And, and, and my youngest son has a little bit of a stutter. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think those, those counsels, those advice, um, those thoughts are all helpful. I'm not suggesting they're not. They are all helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it be, you know, proper breathing or the pace in which you're speaking or, how you deliver speeches or comments or whatever it may be. Um, but I, I think the most critical part, I think, of this field is work on fluency, work on better habits, working on adjustments, working on things you need to do and have to do. Often, you know, you get through it, you grow out of it, you become a veiled stutterer, which is, I think, if you spoke to Vice President Biden, he would say that's probably what he is, what I am. And I, I am that myself. I'll flip words around and I do it subconsciously now. I just don't even think about it, but I substitute this word for another word because I feel like something's going to go on in my head. And as right. long as it says the same thing, it's fine. Um, but it's, it's, it's this freeing of the human spirit, the freeing of the spirit of everybody who feels like, you know, this is a disability. It doesn't have to be a disability. It does not have to be a disability, and we shouldn't be defined on whether or not we stutter or don't stutter. I've often called it the beast over the years because I feel like even when I have control, it's always lurking there waiting to come and right, <laughs> jump right. out and uh, seize right. my throat or my breathing, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But do you recall the first time that you really felt that like, uh, hey, I've got this under control. I can beat this. Well, it was interesting. Yeah, I, I, um, it's, a, it's a really good question. I would say that one of the things that helped me, and this is going to sound a little bizarre, um, I played a lot of sports in high school. I played football, ran track, played baseball. And I think, uh, and I was pretty successful um, in all those areas. And I think my success in working with other people and, and my teammates and feeling good about myself, my ability to, to achieve in whatever field, in this case it was athletically, uh, I mean, I was a good high school student as well, but I think that uh, gave me the confidence to be more secure about myself holistically. And I remember when I went to college, I went to a small business school called Babson College outside of, outside of Boston. And I remember in the early days, I would always sit in the front row paying attention. I wanted to make sure I heard everything the teacher said, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'd raise my hand to answer a question. And I knew my, you know, my classmates would say, oh, boy, here goes a, you know, a five minute answer, what should be a one minute answer, because I would, you know, I would stutter. But I, you know, I ran for an office when I was a freshman. I later became vice president of my student body, became president of my senior class, president of student government. I mean, but I kept pushing. I kept pushing myself and kept raising my hand. That's really the point. I kept raising my hand, put myself in a position where I wasn't going to be hidden. And you know what I had to say, the question I had to ask was important to me and it was important. It was on the subject and I wanted to get answers to it or I wanted to contribute something. So I think that tenacity, which came in my case, that personal self-confidence, that feeling of self-worth in my case, really came through not only my mother, but it came through sports, I think, for me, uh, that ability to feel strong about myself. Well, uh, my last question is, uh, uh, if you were, uh, could talk to your younger self, what, would you, what kind of advice would you give the him? Your voice should not be defined by whether or not it's fluent or not. Your voice is defined by what's in your heart, what's in your mind, what's in your spirit, and what you can offer to a conversation and to uh, problem solving and making the world a better place for everybody. So um, work on your fluency. It's a good thing. 
um, and be as successful as you can with it. But whatever degree of success should not define the degree of involvement and engagement that you have with the rest of the world. The work that AIS is doing is really beautiful, and I and I'm um, just honored to be involved every year and be a participant every year. And uh, I might might add, if I if I could, I don't know when the appropriate time, Clarence, but I don't want to get off the stage for a moment here without saying something. Our our sponsorship was at a fifty thousand dollar level, and I'd like to provide a challenge. We'll double that if we get you know the uh, the support tonight from others. Arthur, did I just hear you right? If the American Institute for Stuttering raises another fifty thousand dollars, you're going to match that for a hundred thousand dollars total towards speech therapy scholarships. Arthur, that is so generous. Thank you so very, very much. And that's because of the beauty of the work that AIS is doing, and the beauty of the minds and the spirits of all these uh, students uh, that participate and learn from AIS in a variety of ways. So that's an addition. That's very welcome. Thank you very much, Arthur. That, uh, that, that's very welcome and uh, will be put to very good use. It's been great talking to you, and I look forward to the time that we can be socially close rather than distant. I agree. I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. And now back to you, Eric. Wow, what an insightful and moving conversation. Thanks again, Arthur and Clarence. Now let's hear from several good friends of the American Institute for Stuttering. Austin Pendleton, a renowned actor on both stage and screen, started to stutter at age seven and has helped propel and define his career. Always open about his challenges, Austin is also quick to celebrate his successes. We welcome him to our Freeing Voices Changing Lives Gala this evening. I'm Austin Pendleton and I, um, I'm very thrilled and happy and honored to be here. I think the American Institute for Stuttering is remarkable. The first time I was aware of stuttering was that this kid was making fun of it. I found in acting, it was easier to harness, but I'm, I'm always frightened of it when I'm acting. Well, I was in the original cast of Fiddler on the Roof. I played Mundell the Taylor. Fiddler on the Roof was directed by Jerome Robbins, who was one of the giants of musical theater. And some nights it would be just under the right amount of control, and some nights I would be totally fluent, and that was wrong. And some nights it would be unwatchable. But I, the point is I had no control over it. So I would pass the days in total anxiety. So I spent a lot of that winter working on my speech and all that, because because Jerry was so impressed that I wasn't stuttering anymore. And I wanted to make sure that that was going to hold. And then I got into rehearsal and I began to stammer, not anything like, you know, oh, dad, but I began to really openly stutter. And Jerry said to me, um, he said, no, no, don't worry about it. First of all, it's not anything like it was, but you are still stuttering. I think any stutter would tell you that's part of the real me, but I don't want to do it again. I don't want that to be the definition of who I am as an actor. So what I would say to anybody who's watching this is inhale the other person's lines and exhale your own. Embrace it as the part of you that it is, but because it is part of you, allow it to give you compassion for other people in whatever their struggle is. But I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here. And I think it's, this organization is so infinitely valuable that um, I'm very happy to be talking to you all. Our next guest, Wayne Brady, received the Freeing Voices Changing Lives Award in 2017. An award-winning host, comedian, and actor, Wayne has always used positivity and creativity to find his voice and help influence others. Hey everybody, good evening. Um, I'm Wayne Brady, and I would just like to thank everyone for having me tonight. Um, and it's my pleasure to be a guest here at the American Institute for Stuttering. I had such an amazing time a couple years ago, and that's why I wanted to come back to be able to speak tonight. I never thought of myself as a stutterer, to be completely honest. It wasn't until at the gala that I, after watching such heroic young people speak and owning who they are, I had to admit in that second, I went, yeah, okay, I guess I'm a stutterer. And the I guess I'm a stutterer had to change from I guess I'm a stutterer to yes, 
I am someone who has stuttered and who still stutters. In my journey, I wanted to be a performer so badly that I was not going to let a stutter stop me. I was not going to let anything stop me. I spent such a long time keeping my voice to myself. Vulnerability and being able to be honest with my journey of stuttering has helped me because if I own up to it, you can't make fun of me and I can't be ashamed. So now what? Now you have to listen to me. No one until the age of 16 could ever tell you that I could sing or that I could perform or that I could do anything because I didn't talk a lot. I wish that there would have been an institute when I was younger. I wish that I would have learned those tools and I wish that I would have had my self-esteem earlier. The Institute is helping arm these young people with the ability to just live, to just enjoy talking with your friends, to not feel anxiety if someone says, excuse me, what time is it? To just be able to, to speak. So in closing, I just wanted to thank, uh, thank the Institute for having me and I hope that maybe something that I said resonated with even one person in the audience tonight. I hope that I could see you all in person next year. That's my big hope. Thank you for letting me share my journey. Thanks Wayne and Austin for sharing your inspiring journeys with us tonight. Founded in 1998 by speech language pathologist Catherine Montgomery, the mission of AIS remains the same to provide universally affordable, state-of-the-art speech therapy to people of all ages who stutter. So now let's hear from the heart and soul of our organization, the clients and clinicians of AIS. What do you think that the AIS community promotes? Freedom. Um, freedom, acceptance, self-love, and finding your own voice, that active choice not to hide has re revolutionized everything for me. The AIS community has been a place where I really feel like I belong. I think AIS's philosophy is radical self-acceptance, empowerment, and effective c c uh, 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 communication. AIS offers one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions for people of all ages who stutter. We work with people in person in our offices as well as online. And we also offer a lot of workshops, online group therapy opportunities, public speaking workshops, and more. As someone who's worked with people who stutter for over 30 years, I can say with 100% honesty that the work that we're doing at AIS is groundbreaking. Where many speech therapies focus on changing the way the person speaks, our approach is looking at the emotional and cognitive components that tend to trigger more stuttering. It's not even so much focusing on the stuttering, it's focusing on communication, which is something we all need to work on. And so that, that was most impactful, what we learned as a family. At first I was afraid that we weren't going to be able to afford it. So the scholarships and the financial aid helped tremendously. So many of the clients that call us and are seeking therapy can't afford a full fee and don't have the insurance coverage. And so it is incredibly fulfilling to work for an organization where people can come to us when they are ready to make big changes and not just when they can afford it. The problem of stuttering isn't necessarily stuttering itself. It's all of the things that happen because of how hard we try not to stutter. And what we really are concerned about at AIS is, is this person saying what they wanna say? Are they doing what they want to do, and are they living the life they want to live? AIS has, has taught me that just because I am a person that stutters, uh, does it doesn't mean that there is something wrong with me. And just because I do stutter, uh, doesn't mean that I'm not communicating effectively. My favorite part about it is that it's a place where you can speak, speak freely. AIS uh, promotes just like a feeling 
of safety. I find that AIS is a great opportunity for people who stutter uh, to connect. Being able to actually fellowship with others who stutter makes a big difference. It's so great to have like a network of people to like be there like when you're having a hard time. Just like anything else, like when you have a family behind you and you're out in the world, you feel the strength of that family. That's what the AAS community does for people. I kept trying to do it alone. Stuttering isn't just what you hear on the surface, right? Like I'm a person who stutters regardless of whether I am stuttering on words right now. Self-acceptance and love and being free is about community. Like we don't do that by ourselves. It really is okay to stutter and it's worth saying what you have to say, whether you stutter or not. The thing that makes us so special is that we really do meet the client where they're at and, and collaborate with them to create a very individualized therapy plan that is more than just the physical, it actually incorporates the whole person. Every single aspect of it is filled with authenticity and spontaneity and joy. I love AIS because the Uh, support me and just always are on my side through any challenge that I could face. AIS is not going to get rid of your stuttering and it's not going to even pretend like that's a goal, but it can change your relationship to your stuttering. And that in and of itself is freedom. Now, the director of the American Institute for Stuttering, Dr. Heather Grossman. AIS is first and foremost a community where people who stutter can come and feel supported and receive top-notch individual and group therapy and support at a fee that they can afford. We want to serve as many people who stutter as we possibly can. All speech-language pathologists, in order to be licensed and certified, go through master's um, training programs and internships. But we know that stuttering is very, very different. So those who work with people who stutter really try to zero in on increasing their stuttering education. So I find it very, very important that if you have a child who stutters or if you are a person who stutters, you really are best served by going to a specialist. I think our clients are really surprised at how much of the work has to do with sort of changing their self-talk. It, it's, it seems like the first step is this amazing affirmation as they come into therapy and see that their therapist is someone who stutters. The first thing they're told is, if they can do it, I can do it too. That's the message that they receive as soon as they walk in that door. So to me, it's just positive upon positive. It, it truly is a community. We find that the one-on-one -on -one therapy is unbelievably important. And it's like sort of the work that you do with your coach if you're an athlete. Then the community involvement is kind of the, the game, you know, and learning to use the the skills uh, of self-confidence and self-affirmation and um, intention to communicate. Working with people who stutter is challenging and fascinating and unbelievably rewarding. When I see someone who I perceive as a sort of muffled down version of themselves because they just don't want their stuttering to be so obvious, and then over a few months to see their personality come out, their goals be met. Typically their voice is louder, their face is more animated, they're saying more, you know, it's more like they're an authentic version of themselves. So I guess really is special. I mean, many people tell us it feels like a home to them, but as soon as they come in, it's like they almost feel a burden lifted off their shoulder because they know they can give themselves full permission to be who they are, full permission to stutter, full permission to say what they want to say, even if they think they're going to stutter.
So to me, that makes it the most special place I can think of. So I really want to give a personal thank you to our board of directors. It was absolutely amazing. We couldn't do any of this without their incredible guidance and generosity, um, as well as our corporate and individual donors. And to them, I send a personal thank you. Thanks, Heather. You're absolutely fantastic. What incredible work you and the other clinicians at AIS are doing every day. What a night. What a night. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone involved in supporting the mission here at American Institute of Stuttering. I had the most wonderful time. Um, I need to really thank our donors for making this evening such a smash success. Um, I appreciate it so much. You are changing people's lives. Um, very special thank you to Vice President Joe Biden. Thank you, sir, for giving up so much of your time tonight. It was a great honor um, and it was utterly inspiring to hear your story. Um, I need to give a huge special shout out to my friend Eric Donalo. Um, you are the backbone of American Institute of Stuttering. The virtual gala would never have happened without you. Thank you, Eric, so much. Um, so up next and lastly, there are a few very special thank yous. There are some words of inspiration from the many faces here at the American Institute of Stuttering. Thank you for having me in your homes tonight. Um, thank you for listening. At AIS, I learned that speech itself is just one small part of communication. I can communicate effectively through my message, my knowledge, and my confidence. I learned that it is truly okay to stutter. They, they don't focus on being fluent. They focus on saying what you want to say. It has helped me to be more patient with my stutter and each day to be my most uh, uh, original and uh, uh, authentic self. At AIS, the true understanding of all of those and how you could overcome it um, is a value that I've definitely learned from them. My, my, my first session with Haya definitely like completely made like a total difference for me. It was amazing. I learned that it's okay to have a stutter and I should not let it hold you back from living your life to the fullest. Going to AIS um, gave me the confidence to be comfortable with a stutterer and know that I'm not always going to say everything perfect all the time. As soon as I started uh, working with AIS, I felt so much better and more in control of my own body. Therapy at AIS is unique because you are surrounded by so many empowering individuals who also stutter. I basically learned what stuttering actually is, how to lean into a stutter, and now I feel comfortable to talk to people. Fluency isn't the goal if it means sacrificing what you want and what you need to say. At AIS, I learned about hope and the importance of beliefs and that I can do whatever it is that I believe that I can do. That stuttering is not going to stop me. Speak freely, live fearlessly. Speak freely, live fearlessly. Speak freely, live fearlessly. Speak freely, live fearlessly.